Well, if God has a work and a purpose for his church, if he has an end time work, if he has something he wants to accomplish, surely he would have left us some instructions, wouldn't he? And that's what his word is all about. If you'll turn to chapter 17 to the book of Acts, we're going to continue our study from the word of God, setting forth the spiritual principles by which you're going to conduct your life and ministry. Everyone in the body of Christ has a ministry. There are certain principles taught in the word of God that should govern our thinking, the way we pray, how we approach sinners, other Christians with the deeper word or sinners with the gospel. And dear friend, I hope you've been sitting through the studies and assuming you have, I trust that you're gathering that God doesn't need any help. He just needs a vessel who is faithful to his word. As long as you think that you can convict and save sinners by something you do or have to do, that will obscure the voice of the shepherd. They can't hear him, they're just hearing you. But if you'll learn the word and present the word, then God's will is going to be done through your life and ministry through this church. God, in a real sense, is handicapped by our inability to move with and by the Spirit. It's in this hour that God is trying to show us some things. And I've been stressing all through the study of the book of Acts this fact that I have already stated this morning, that God wants you to be a faithful witness to his word that he doesn't want you helping him, he just wants you to move with him. And while we stress that, it does not mean there is not a place, and hear me say it, for travail in the spirit and a burden for souls and a desire to see all men saved and a laboring in the gospel and seeing yourself as beseeching them in Christ's stead that they might be saved. But the burden is the thing that should cause you to want to do it the way God wants it done so that he can bear fruit through you. And I must stress that the whole psychology of evangelism in the 20th century is not scripture. The whole psychology from beginning to end is not Bible. And I trust you've been seeing that, that there are places where the Holy Spirit doesn't even want you to go with the word. And if you have this notion that's so prevalent today that compassion is to govern everything, you're going to miss the voice of God. The compassion should cause you to want to see every man saved, but let's go where the Spirit sends us, and let's say what he wants us to say, and let's do it his way. And if we don't stress that, then we're just going to have a series of 20 tapes or something on the book of Acts, and we're going to miss what God's saying. Because, dear friends, you have been brainwashed. I can thank God I wasn't brainwashed in this area. But then he knows who he wants to use in a certain way, and he gives us a message. And this is a message I've preached for 23 years. This isn't something new since I got the baptism. And we're going to see it again here. Watch. Paul is never frustrated if somebody doesn't believe. Oh, he's concerned, but not frustrated. There's a difference. He doesn't try to devise a new method if something didn't seem to work somewhere. He stays with the word. Let's begin with verse 22. Here he is in Athens, the New York of Greece, the cultural center of Greece. Paul stood on Mars Hill, in the midst of Mars Hill, and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. That's what the Greek says. You're very religious. For as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. And I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. We've already read the other verses, so we'll skip down now to the response to his sermon, his message. Verse 32, and when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. And so Paul departed from among them, Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed among them, which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. But as a whole, the people did not respond. 
We've seen this over and over again, that Paul will go into a city, he'll be stoned, he'll be forced to flee for his life. The Jews will oppose him in the gospel. They'll speak evil of the way. And never once do you ever see Paul frustrated or defeated. And what I'm saying is this this morning, that every sermon in every city is not going to be a Pentecost. You see it over and over in the book of Acts. Here's the great apostle Paul in the New York of Greece, and he gets a handful at the most, a handful of converts. Now think for a moment what people would say if Billy Graham had a response like that in New York City. Well, who got saved, Billy? Well, let's see, there was Dionysius the Areopagite, and there, I think, yes, there was a woman named Damaris, and a few others. Oh my, he's losing his touch. <laughs> And so every message in every city, every place you go to witness, you're not going to get what you call, or what the church rather calls, positive results. When you start measuring success in terms of decisions made, and how many walk an aisle, and how many make some decision or another, then Paul was a failure in Athens. Perhaps he should have changed his methods. We've got a lot of methods today. You learn the methods in the seminaries and in the churches. Southern Baptists have more methods than they have people to carry them out. In fact, all the other denominations have patterned themselves after the Southern Baptists, which I guess you already know is my background. And if they can't get decisions or results in one way, then they'll devise new methods. They have whole committees and meetings where they sit around to devise new techniques and methods and psychological approaches to get people to make a decision. They have books written on it, how to bring a person to a decision. So perhaps Paul should have devised some new methods. Perhaps he should have gotten a committee together and planned an Athens crusade. <laughs> and sent in his staff ahead of him to have announced the soon arrival of the Apostle Paul Evangelistic Crusade Incorporated. I love that incorporated. And so perhaps he should have devised some new methods and maybe if it had a hundred, five hundred voiced choir behind him when he gave his invitation. By the way, he didn't give one. <laughs> You don't find the apostles or Jesus giving invitations to come to an altar. They presented the word. And if a person believed it, he didn't have to say, now here's what you do. They just automatically began to follow him and his teachings. But anyway, if he'd have had a 500 voice choir, perhaps he could have gotten more decisions. Well, if you're sitting out there thinking, and if you're new here, you probably are thinking. If you're not new here, you're not thinking, you're listening. <laughs> which is which is quite an accomplishment because when you can stop thinking and start listening with the heart, then you're ready to receive the word of God with all readiness of mind, as we saw here in chapter 17. And you will go home and search the scriptures, verse 11, to see if what we're telling you is so. And so if you're out there thinking, are you opposed to evangelistic crusades? On the contrary, not if they're inspired and initiated by the Holy Spirit. Amen. That isn't the question that needs to be asked. You don't have to ask me, am I opposed to evangelistic crusades, friends? I'm spending all my time in crusades of one form or another. But the question to be asked, are you opposed to the Holy Spirit initiating and directing every meeting or crusade? Are you opposed? Are you willing to accept the results he produces? The how many and the who and the what. And most Christians are not. They don't have that kind of faith to trust the Holy Spirit to do the work. That's why we need all the gimmicks and the schemes and the psychology. If it doesn't work, anyone to come forward. We sang 14 more courses. This will be the last one. And we sang 23 after we say the last one. Well, that doesn't work. We'd only have one at the altar or none. Bow your heads now. Everyone that wants to receive Jesus or wants to make a decision, slip up your hand. Nobody will say, you don't be afraid. Slip up your hand. Psychology. Or slip out quietly while our heads are bowed. I don't ever see Jesus saying, slip out quietly to receive me. He says, I want you to make it public. You'll probably lose your life before you get here. But he says... <laughs> got the gimmicks. And if you measure success in terms of seeing people do things so it'll look like the pastor's accomplishing something, you see, that's why a lot of this goes on. 
to get people to make decisions, the same people, Christians saved, you know, and now every Sunday, Wednesday, getting them to make decisions. So it looks like we're doing something. I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I just have to be faithful to the Lord. Are you willing to trust the Holy Spirit to produce the results? Most Christians don't have that kind of faith. You know the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19. I don't know if you've ever read it. You might have read the words, but I don't know if you've ever read it. With the understanding of what he's saying there, there is no word here about go ye into all the world and see how many men you can get to make decisions. Verse 19, go therefore and disciple all nations. That's what the Greek says, make disciples of all nations. Verse 20, and teach them. Oh, that's too much trouble. Teach them to observe all things that I have requested, no, commanded you. Now that's the commission, dear friends. He hasn't sent us out to see how many decisions we can get but to go make disciples and to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I, the Lord, the God of heaven, I, he says, have commanded you. Well, that's too much work. Teach, make disciples. So the stress is upon filling the pews, promoting the program, meeting the budget, seeing how many we can get to come planning a great campaign or crusade so that we can get people into our church or our denomination. But the commission is go make a disciple of Jesus, not go make a Baptist, Lutheran, or Methodist out of him. Go make a disciple to follow Jesus. Teach them not to try to get every Sunday saved Christians to make some decision and come down here so it looks like we're doing something and earning our pay, if you think of it in those terms. And teach them to observe. Observe means to do. And very few people do what he said. James said, be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. Why? You deceive yourself. You don't deceive anyone else but yourself. And he says, observe all things. Not some things. Not pick and choose. Not what is convenient. Not what's popular. Not what others are doing. But to observe all things that I have commanded you. I have commanded you. I have commanded you. Not what men have said Christ said, not what men have added to what Christ said, but he said what I have said in my word. So receive the word, chapter 17, verse 11, with all readiness of mind, go home and search the scriptures daily to see if these things be so. So observe what I command you, not a polite request, but an order from our commander. We don't have a right to pick and choose what we want to obey or to try to figure out what's convenient or expedient. But observe what I command. It isn't a request. He has commanded us to do all these things. Amen. Quit looking for a church where they'll let you get by with as much as you can and still be saved. Do all things he commanded. It's an order from headquarters. I mean, soldiers who disobey their commanders, they're court-martialed, and if it's serious enough, they're shot. Amen. Christians will obey their employers, their teachers. They will obey the government officials. They will obey the police. And when the sovereign God of heaven gives us a command, well, at best, he is politely ignored and at worst, openly defied by professing Christians. Oh, that's your interpretation. I don't believe that. Who are you to tell me? I've heard it for 23 years. You don't have a right to say that. I don't have a right to say it. It's a command. He said all things, teach them to observe all things I've commanded you, not the person sitting next to you, you. Not the church over the next county, you. Not the apostolic church, you. Not the preachers and evangelists and missionaries only, but you. And so, you notice here in chapter 17, verses 32 and following, that Paul is not frustrated, doesn't consider himself a failure. And I would suggest to you that if the apostle who was the leading 
exponent of the will and revelation and word of God because practically the whole New Testament is written by this man. If he was satisfied to go into the largest city in the empire with a handful of converts, then we can save ourselves a lot of frustration and worry if we'll do what he did and not be concerned about how many decisions but the quality of those decisions Amen. by teaching them. He taught them on Mars Hill. All through the word, they're teaching, teaching. Yes, there's a place to preach, but there's a decided difference. They're not even the same words in Greek. And when you're evangelizing sinners, certainly preach to them the simple gospel of faith. But that isn't the commission. The commission is to make a disciple with your evangelizing and then teach him. And you don't make a disciple and turn him over to somebody else right away, but you're obligated. You bring somebody to Christ, don't bring them to Brother Freeman. Start teaching them to observe. Baptism, water baptism, baptism in the Holy Ghost. Two kinds of baptism. Tell them right away that they need to observe these things. Paul's concern was to be faithful to the word. That was his first concern. He had a compassion that all men would be saved. You see, these two things are not opposites, contradictions, ruling out one another, a compassion that all would believe, compassion for souls. That's why he labored so hard in the gospel, but never frustrated, never considered himself a failure when they rejected him because he was moving with the Spirit of God. And he knew that God had said his word can't return void. And you think because God has said his word won't return void, that means somebody's going to get saved. That does not mean that. It means it will accomplish what God said, the purpose for which I sent it, and will prosper in the thing for which I sent it, and will accomplish the thing which I please. Paul was stoned in Lystra and left for dead. That's some rejection of the word. He was cast out of Thessalonica and all through the book of Acts over and over he had to flee or had to leave. You'll see it right again in chapter 18. Immediately as soon as he starts preaching, he has to leave certain areas. And here in Athens, just a handful of converts and never once thought of himself as a failure. Jesus had 12, remember? And he said, one of you is not really one that I've chosen. He said, you're a devil. Well, the whole world perished when Noah preached for 120 years. That's pretty much a failure. He had eight people who believed him. They were all his relatives. He preached, we're told, a preacher of righteousness for 120 years while the ark was building and the whole world mocked and laughed and ridiculed. Ezekiel had none who believed. God said, go preach, but I'll tell you before they go, they won't even listen. Why go? He said, because they'll know I've sent a prophet to be among them. That was his purpose. That was his only purpose for that hour. You have to see this side to understand how to not get in the way of God when he sends you someplace. You don't go out with the attitude, well, if they don't believe, I'll just shake the dust off my feet and say your blood be upon your own heads. You don't go with that attitude. But if that's the result, you're not frustrated. You say, praise God, his purpose was accomplished. Oh, it's a rest. Faith is a rest. Knowing the word of God and how the spirit works is a rest. I don't sit at home and bite my nails and worry about what would happen if nobody shows up at Fort Wayne. Listen, friends, I know about Fort Wayne. I labored there for a year. When we had 12 who'd come out to here, we had a crowd. And by faith, I rented three rooms, big ballrooms and a motel, knowing that other. That was faith over there. Yes, God filled it up. But you see, dear friends, I would not have felt myself a failure if I was the only one that showed up. Because he said, go. That's the only thing that's important. If he says, go, that you know you're moving with the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Paul had a simple message that he confirmed with the signs following. He could demonstrate the word. And he didn't have to prove it. He just preached it and demonstrated it. Methods he didn't need, techniques, psychology, 
Certainly you have some methods just to cross the street to say Jesus loves you as a method. So we're not opposed to methods of a sort if they don't get in the way, if they're not a substitute for your faith in the Holy Spirit to convict and save sinners. Now you know I'm telling you the truth. The average Christian who would experience what Paul did in Athens, who would have been stoned in Lystra, cast out of Thessalonica, who was hounded everywhere he went and people rejecting and ridiculing and opposing the word, the average Christian would be on his knees, Lord, where am I missing it? Lord, what's wrong? Why am I suffering persecution? Why won't the people believe? And Paul never once went back to Antioch, the church he was sent out from apologizing for Athens. Never occurred to him to say, well, I'm sorry, folks, if we'd probably planned a little better advertising campaign and sent a staff in there to announce the Apostle Paul Evangelistic Crusade Incorporated is coming. <laughs> never apologized. Oh, I'll tell you, psychology, man's methods and denominational ways of getting people to an altar can make men walk an aisle and make a decision, but only the Holy Spirit can get them to repent. Amen. Hallelujah. You can get churches, and we've got churches filled with people who are not even saved. I don't care what church you belong to. It's an exception if one-tenth of them are saved. Oh, some of you can't handle that. I pastored a church where none were saved. First Baptist. But see, God hasn't called you to get up here and say it. So I'm going to say it because he's called me to say it. <laughs> people said in that church, you preach like there are lost people in this church. They didn't know that they were all lost. <laughs> I said, that's right. It was all right as long as they thought I was preaching to sinners out in the street. But they discovered after 30 days the honeymoon was over after they called me. And they said, why, well, you're preaching this to us. You're acting like they're lost people in this Baptist church. Can you imagine that? The presumption of me to think that anybody <laughs> would be lost in a Baptist church. Oh, friends, God wants all men to be saved. Yes, he does. He's not willing that any should perish. His will is that all men would come to repent and to believe the gospel. That's... What Peter said, he's not willing, he's long-suffering that all should come to repentance and acknowledging the truth. But listen, his will for you is to present the word in such a way that they can come to repentance and not to some church denomination or teaching. That you be willing to discipline yourself in the word and to be willing to do it his way and accept the results Knowing you can't convict and save sinners, why don't you just say, well, really, I can't. I'll trust him to do it. And God has promised that if you'll be faithful to his word, that he will bless it. For he said, my word will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which I sent him. Well, let's read chapter 18 because he continues the same message here. We see the same spiritual principle being set forth here. <coughs> In, we'll just go through verse 11. And keep in mind that what God is wanting us to learn is the way that he works and put all of our faith in the Word and in the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I'm just a yielded vessel to hear your voice, to go where you want me to go, to do what you want me to do, whether it's to pray for a sick one, whether it's to take them the Word, whether it's to talk to a sinner, just follow you. And I believe that you will prosper my witness because your word says it will. So after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because that Claudius, that Caesar, had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. And he came unto them. Because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers. You see, every Jew had to learn a trade. So this is the way Paul supported himself. Now, I don't want to digress into that. Sometimes when we teach on the ministry as such, we'll show you what Paul says. He elected to do this. He told no other one to follow his example unless they wanted to. He said, for he that preaches the gospel is to live by the gospel. You see. 
But he said, I choose to do this. I'm a tent maker, so I'm going to pay my own way. That doesn't mean he never took love offerings. Why, he's thanking churches for them giving to his needs. But he chose to do it this way. So that's the story behind him making tents. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Gentiles. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. That's what we've been trying to tell you this morning. That when some of you showed up the meeting there, it helps me. He was pressed in his spirit when he got this moral, spiritual support. And he really got the anointing. So I told you, the room isn't big enough to hold all of you. You let the Lord lead you. But I said, if you come, I'm going to praise the Lord for whoever I see. And I did. Because the only amens was, I said to the people, that's my people. <laughs> because some of the statements we made, they knew worked. And the others, they, they had to think it through. Oh, no medicine, no surgery. Old rugged cross is all you need. You don't need blue cross. You wouldn't get an amen on that. Not in Fort Wayne or Syracuse, New York. So it was our people who were saying amen because they had put it to practice. And so you see, as you read the word, you see people are human beings. And so when Silas and Timothy came, he was pressed in the spirit. That is, he was anointed. And so he really, under the anointing, testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Well, he was already saying that. We just read that. He was preaching and teaching in the synagogue. But now he has this spiritual support behind him. But when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Now it would never occur to an evangelist or teacher today to do a thing like that. Now he shouldn't do it except motivated by the Spirit, of course. But it would never occur to him. Well, how are you going to win people if you don't, just bend over backwards and show your love for them. Dear friends, you better learn to move with the Spirit because the time comes when God says, I'm closing the door there. And if you're there after he's closed the door, you're not only going to get hurt and get in trouble, but you're just wasting your time. Do you believe that can happen? It sure can happen. It sure can happen. Praise the Lord. Amen. He can do it. It doesn't mean you go around and say with an attitude like this because Paul didn't. He labored day and night to persuade sinners. But there's a point beyond which he would not go. Led of the Spirit. And he'd write Ichabod over the church door, the synagogue. The Lord has departed. That's what it means. And so when they blasphemed, he shook his raiment. He said, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go to those who will hear it, is what he's saying. And the central teaching here in chapter 18, as I've said, there's many spiritual principles set forth in the book of Acts that we're trying to glean out to apply to our lives and ministry. Is this that response to the gospel is not dependent upon the efforts and persuasion of men, because we're going to see in the next few verses, in every city, God has a people. Even before they believe, he says, they're my people. And they will respond to the call of God through the gospel. And so they rejected, and he departed from there, and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, that worshiped God, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. That means it was right by it. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed the Lord with all his house. There it is again, friends, with all his house, all through the book of Acts. I said, you can claim your families. You should believe for your whole house. So he believed the Lord with all of his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. And then verses 9 to 11 is what I want you to see. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak. And hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. Now look at this, for I have much people in this city. Before he's preached. They're not even saved yet. Oh, that's why you need the other teachings about predestination and the sovereignty of God and election. Why do you suppose we've labored in those scriptures with you? So that you can understand what verse 10 is saying. 
that God can say to Paul as he enters a city, don't be afraid to speak because I've got a lot of people in the city. The only people in that city were Jews and synagogues who had not heard the gospel. But before we get to that, I want you to notice verse 6 because it's very important that Paul tells us that when they opposed themselves and blasphemed that he then told them your blood be upon your own heads I'm going to those who will listen to it I want you to observe the attitude of God toward those who reject the truth he charges them with two things first of all with opposing themselves secondly with blaspheming just to oppose the truth is blasphemy you thought blasphemy was taking God's name in vain he says to oppose my message through my messenger is blasphemy they oppose themselves that's rather a strange expression isn't it but really if you understand the nature of truth and error and opposition you will see that anyone who opposes the gospel is opposing himself to oppose the truth Christian as it comes through the anointed messenger is to oppose yourself I wish you'd turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2 because the same, the same expression is used throughout the word of God that opposition to the truth is not opposition to anybody but yourself. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and let's begin reading verse 22. Now he's writing to Timothy, this young minister. He says, flee also youthful lusts but follow righteousness, faith, love, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, ministry, there's a lot of ministry goes out from this church, teaching and so forth, and every one of you is a minister because when you're witnessing and testifying and praying for the sick and all, you're ministering, body ministry. We need to learn this, and I have learned it a long time ago. You cannot argue anybody into truth. So he says, foolish and unlearned, people who don't know the word of God, they're unlearned, foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they only gender strife. There's some questions I won't even attempt to answer that people ask because I know what they're trying to do. I know the motivation behind it. I can see and hear the devil in the question. They're trying to gender strife. Sometimes they'll stand up in a meeting, can I ask a question? And I'll say no. <laughs> Or they'll already ask it before they even ask and they ask it. You say, if you've got a problem, brother, sister, be happy to talk with you after. Because you see, I know what else he said. I'm not just putting them down or off. I go on and follow what he says. The servant of the Lord won't strive. He must not strive. Be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. Most men don't know how to teach anything, but ready to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. There it is. A person who wants to debate the Christian truth or argue his position is opposing himself. So be patient with those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. They need to repent of that. And you should... Give them time. By your patience, you're giving God time to work in their heart to bring them to repentance and acknowledge that what you say is the truth so that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who has taken them captive at his will. And time and time again, I've seen people who are snared by the devil. They debate and argue and fuss and quarrel with the truth, the message of faith or the crucified life and so on the truth of healing, or the baptism of the Holy Spirit in speaking in tongues. We're not to argue with them and debate. You don't have to defend what you believe if it's truth. Truth doesn't have to be defended. All the opposition to truth in the world cannot overcome truth. Truth's a wall that will stand there after all the winds of opposition blow away. Amen. And a person who just keeps Battling the truth is really battling a wall with his head, butting his head against the wall. He's opposing himself and doesn't know it. And eventually that wall will collapse on him and crush him, Jesus said. You don't have to defend what's truth, friends. Just present the truth. Truth stands. Truth is a fact. All the denial in the world is going to change the fact that Jesus is the Christ. 
That'll stand. And when everything has gone or disappeared, that fact will stand. And every other fact and truth in the Word. It doesn't matter what my denomination or unbelief says about speaking in tongues for today or the baptism. I've got it. It's happened. Nothing they say can change that. A man with the experience is not at the mercy of the man with the theological arguments. I said that to a former student of mine who had heard about us becoming charismatic. And I said, well, you know, and he knew what I taught in the seminary was opposite to what I'd experienced. Well, I said, I've discovered that a man with the experience isn't at the mercy of the man with the theological arguments. Well, he said, I thought it was the other way around. <laughs> well, I said, no, I'm afraid it isn't. You think about that for a while. You've got all the theological arguments against the baptism and speaking in tongues, but here I've got the experience. So whatever you say can't change the fact I've experienced reality. It's like salvation. Let them say Jesus is not alive. In my case, I say, well, you should have told me 24 years ago he's been living in my heart for 23 years, so I know he's alive. You don't have to defend truth. But we should, as we minister to the lost or to non-charismatics or to charismatics who are not as learned in the Word as they should be, let us pray the Holy Spirit will show them. And I'm assuming you are in fellowship with the Lord and in fellowship with his Word yourself. I'm assuming that, therefore, let us pray that the Holy Spirit will show them that what you're trying to tell them, what you're trying to show them, what you're trying to teach them is from the Lord. And if they oppose that, they're not opposing you. You're just a person, but they're opposing themselves. And then he says, secondly, that they blaspheme. So opposition to the truth, Acts 18, 6, is not only opposition to yourself, but it's opposition to God. And that's much more serious. I just wish there was some way for me to impress upon those who sit under the word of the grave responsibility that you have and they have to give heed and to obey and to listen with all of their hearts and not to sit out there with their proof texts or with their attitudes or whatever and try to figure out ways not to receive it or obey it whether they don't like the color tie you wear, whatever it is they're getting their attention on instead of the word, just forget the vessel and see the Lord speaking to them through the word. If you don't believe it's the Lord, it's a reflection on your intelligence to keep coming to hear it. I'm going to put all the responsibility where it belongs, friends. If people could be made to understand what is happening when... Every time this body meets and the word is open, I believe they would give more heed to what is said and obey the Lord more without having to be persuaded over and over to do things that some of you are still not doing. Some of you still need deliverance from resentment. Some of you are still not receiving me. You think I don't know that? You see, that's why I love you or I wouldn't stand here and speak to you. <coughs> this precious word. I would invite you not to come because it's a lot easier not to look at some of you. And I don't mean a lot of you. I said some of you. That could be one. It could be eight. But dear friends, it is not my problem. It's yours. If you knew what was coming forth from the pulpit, whether it's me standing here, whether you're here somewhere else, if it's an anointed vessel of the Lord, you would fear lest you offend the Lord. You're not opposing me, you're opposing yourself and the Lord. And if a patient won't heed the doctor's advice and take the medicine, now who does a patient hurt? He certainly doesn't hurt the doctor. <laughs> Amen. If you would look upon the word of God as having eternal consequences, that God is going to hold you accountable for every word that you've heard out of this pulpit. Yes, he is. Certainly holds me accountable for what I say, but he holds you accountable for how you hear. We would get into that place of spiritual maturity where we stop looking at one another and the little icks and ticks you don't like and just get to the place where you say this is the Lord that the brother's prophesying the sister's 
speaking in tongues, giving interpretation. This is the Lord. This brother standing in the pulpit, opening the word. This is the Lord speaking to me. If you don't believe that, you're wasting your time to come or to go anywhere. If you don't believe the Lord speaks through his servants. We don't have to digress and say we know better than you that we're not infallible. No, even the apostles and the prophets weren't infallible, but when they spoke under the anointing, it was thus saith the Lord. Amen. Paul had to rebuke Peter, you remember? So Peter wasn't always under the anointing. But when Peter wrote First and Second Peter, he was under the anointing. But he wasn't under the anointing in Matthew 18 when Jesus turned to him and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, and looked right at Peter. Because what Peter said to Jesus wasn't a revelation from heaven. It was from the wrong source. It was Satan trying to turn Jesus from the cross through Peter, his apostle. So he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. And if you have the Spirit of God, you know when it's the Spirit of God speaking to you through the Word. You should know. And so don't ever fall into that snare, well, I don't resist the word, I just resist you, or I don't like you, or I don't agree with your interpretation. Because we said last week, you can't reject the messenger and keep the message. Amen. To reject Jesus said the messenger is to reject Jesus himself. Amen. And you're not rejecting a messenger, you're rejecting his message, because you couldn't care less. If you didn't know me and I said over there, you couldn't care less. But there are people who will reject anybody who stands in this place. And friends, I mean you would be rejected if you were up here by somebody. Paul was rejected everywhere he went by some people. And I will challenge anybody. They'll never say it in my hearing. That's just your interpretation. I've got a right to mine. That is not my interpretation. I wouldn't cross the street to give you my interpretation. There isn't enough money in your bank account to bribe me to give you two words of my interpretation. If I didn't believe it was the Lord, I'd be the last to want to say it. Amen. We've already said no man is infallible. Okay, now let's say he said that. We'll, we'll forget that. Now we're moving into the realm of the anointing. If you believe it's my interpretation, you're wasting your time here this morning. <laughs> If you don't believe it's the word of God, if what I preach, the message of faith, the crucified life, is not exactly what Jesus taught. That's all he taught, discipleship, the crucified life, and the walk of total faith. If you don't believe that's the word, you show me from the word, and I'll be the first to change it. But you notice how I qualified that? You have to show me from the word, not your Baptist Lutheran doctrine. Not what you believe. People are always coming to me and say, well, now I believe. I know you said, but I think. And I always stop them right there. And I say, dear soul, do you hear what you just said? You're telling me what you think. It's I, I, I. But if it is the word of God, and if we're reading it right out of this book for you to see right along with us, then if you oppose that word, you're not opposing Hobart Freeman. You're opposing yourself. You're opposing God. In fact, look what he calls it. Spell it out for yourself. B-L-A-S-B-H-E-M-Y. Blasphemy. We're told in the word of God to put our hand over our mouth when we enter. Learn to be quiet before the Lord and his word. Not to sit and oppose it in your mind or to go out and mouth opposition. If people knew what they were calling down on their heads, they would never criticize God's ministry. Amen. I don't have to say every time we're not talking about error and heresy. We're talking about people. Just that's your opinion. I've got a right to mine. I stand with Paul, and if you... Here in this body, you should stand with Paul, 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. Let me quote it to you. He said, as we have been entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men but God, which trieth our hearts. At no time have we ever used flattering words to try to gain a following. Amen. Now we get this great encouragement. 
appeared to Paul in a vision. He said, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Remember we're saying that he's showing here, in fact throughout the book of Acts, that response to the gospel isn't dependent upon the efforts and persuasion of men, their methods and their techniques. For God has, according to election, a people in every city who will hear the call and respond to it. If you will faithfully present the gospel and not your technique, your interpretation, your denomination, your church, but present the word, God has a people who respond. Even before Paul has preached the word, he said, I've got a people. Now that isn't to be misinterpreted that he looked down through eternity and saw how many Corinthians would believe. We've already taught you enough from the Word of God, the plain teaching of the Word of God, that he says you have been predestinated to hear the call and to believe it. Yes, you have to believe it. That's your responsibility. That's your faith. That's what saves you. But God has a people in every city. Remember, this is exactly what we saw over in chapter 15 and verse 48. You remember that? That after some believed and some rejected? 13, chapter 13. After they had rejected the word, some believed and some rejected it. Then verse 48, and when the Gentiles heard that Paul was going to preach to them, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. If you believe this morning, you were ordained to believe. Why get upset or struggle or quarrel with what the Word says from Genesis to Revelation? Praise God that you have believed through grace. That's the way it is, friends. Get back to chapter 18 and look at verse 27. You want to know why you believe this morning? It's all grace. 18 and verse 27. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. It didn't say they believed, period. They believed by the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. They believed through grace. Oh, these ones he's talking about in Corinth are the same one that Jesus spoke of when he was on earth over in John 10. John chapter 10. Did you know that Jesus said the same thing when he was on earth, that there were a people who would listen to him and there were people who wouldn't listen to him? And he called the one his sheep and the others, the goats, are not sheep. Chapter 10 of John, verse 24, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered and said, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do, I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. Now look at this. But ye believe not. Why? Because you're not my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. He said three things. They hear my voice. That's why you must not obscure it with your methodology. You'd be better off to just quote somebody, John 3.16, than try to, to argue him into the faith. He says, my sheep hear my voice. He says, I know them. He knew every one of them. Already before the foundation of the world, he said he knew you. Ephesians chapter 1, all of those passages we've read you that say that. And he said, my sheep will follow me. Then over in John 17, when he prayed, when he prayed the intercessory prayer, he knew who they were in Corinth that were going to believe. And he knew it because he knew it from eternity. He didn't know it because he could foresee it. He knew it because he foreknew it. Chapter 17, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, saved and lost, all flesh. I don't even want you to read any farther until that soaks in. 
Thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. There's a people given to Christ. Why haven't you been taught that in your church? Why do you run away from those great deep truths of the word? The Bible never hesitates to speak of this. That Christ has a people given to him by the Father who will believe. They have to believe to be saved, but they will believe. He calls them my sheep. He told the religious leaders and those who rejected him, he says it's because you're not my sheep. The responsibility is yours because I invite you to, but you're not coming because you're not my sheep. You see, and if you don't know that, then you get frustrated when people reject your word. Knowing the word keeps down the temperature of frustration, friends. And he says... I have come to give eternal life to as many as you've given me, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now he's praying the greatest prayer of his life right now. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. People say he began there in Bethlehem. Oneness. People try to tell me sometimes, you know, well, this is the beginning of Jesus at Bethlehem. Well, I said, read John 17. He prayed, Lord, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world was created. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. See, they all belong, all the believers of all eternity belong to the Father, and he gave them to Jesus. He says, verse 9, I pray for them. You want me to read the next phrase? This watered-down anemic evangelism today would be afraid to read the next phrase. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. This is his high priestly intercessory prayer for you. There's a time to pray for the world. We're told to pray for the world. Pray that they all might all be saved and believe. But there's a time to pray for those that belong to the Father. And you say, oh, he's just praying for the twelve. All right, get over to verse 20 and he included you. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's us. There's where my name's written. There's where your name is written. Jesus there was praying for you that night. He saw you. He knew your name. He knew when you'd be born. He knew when you'd receive the call to the gospel and believe it. And he prayed for you. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible says. We could give you other passages, but we'll save those for some other time when we're dealing just with that question. But only those who believe in the sovereignty of God and the scriptural doctrine of predestination and election, listen carefully to me, only those know that there will be some who will respond to the gospel. The person who's always teaching, you've got to cooperate with God, let's bargain with this soul and try to get him to accept Jesus. Those who teach that if we do our part, God will do his part in getting us saved can have no assurance that an unrepentant, wicked-hearted sinner, he has no assurance that even one will be redeemed. If it's left up to man, there's no assurance that even one will respond to the call of the gospel. It's only those who believe what the Bible says from Genesis to Revelation, that God has a people. He didn't ask Israel's opinion. He said, you're my people. I'm calling you out to myself. And over and over, The Bible teaches this. The fact of God's sovereign grace is the assurance you can have that when you go witness, somebody's going to believe. And a man who doesn't believe that, not only doesn't believe the book of Acts and the New Testament, but he cannot use scriptural methods in his testimony, witness, and ministry. Because he'll have to devise methods to get responses and decisions. But when he knows there's a people in every city that's going to believe that Jesus has not suffered and died in vain, but he prayed here in John 17, I have given my life for as many as you have given to me, and I pray for them. 
Oh, don't think now of 10 or 12, friends. Revelation says there are so many that are going to be saved out of tribulation, you couldn't count them. Heaven isn't going to populate it with me and my wife and my children and a few more, and that's all. An innumerable host of sinners saved. But you've got to see what the Bible says to use the right methods or you'll never do it. You'll always be trying to push for decisions and numbers just to see how many can make a decision. And sinners are not going to be confronted with the claims of Christ on their soul. They're going to be claimed with your claim, They're going to be confronted with your interpretation and what you've devised. They're going to be confronted with your church or your denomination and not the claims of Christ. And that obscures the voice of the shepherd and the sheep can't hear his voice. They're hearing your way, get it this way, and do this, and don't do that. And you're trying all sorts of methods to get him to say or do something. He doesn't have to say or do a thing. People get saved sitting there. I don't know if you know that. They're saved sitting there. Yes, they have to make a confession, but he didn't say at this altar. They will make it. They'll start following Jesus. Why I've seen people get baptized in the Holy Ghost that I knew wasn't even saved, and, but they got saved and filled just like that, all in one package. What is believing? They suddenly believe it and receive it all. To receive, to be willing to receive the Holy Spirit that Christ gives, they were receiving Christ at the same moment. And we complicate this to the place where they've got to do a certain thing, get on their knees, half shed, at least a pint of tears, I love to see sinners shedding tears. And so you know exactly what we're saying and what we're not saying. But if you believe in each city, there are people that belong to God, even before they know it. That's what the Bible says. That if you will faithfully proclaim his word that you've been taught and not be concerned about what am I going to do if nobody believes or responds, or what should I do? What methods of preparation and all to get their hearts ready should I do? You can't do anything. The Holy Spirit prepares the heart. Pray before you go. They'll get their hearts prepared through your prayer. If you believe that God has a people in every city, as the Bible says, that if you'll faithfully proclaim the word that they can hear the voice of the shepherd, then you won't have to devise any methods to try to get a decision. Because all they need to hear is the voice of the shepherd. Not your voice, Amen. not your technique, not your theology. In fact, if you devise any method, you're going to obscure his voice and they can't hear it. And they'll join your church, they'll be part of the glory barn, they'll believe what you believe, but it's all in the head, not the heart. And so Jesus and Paul and the apostles were accused of turning the world upside down with their message, not their methods. They didn't have any methods. Just whatever the Holy Spirit directed them to do. Oh, I don't mean they went around in confusion and said, well, we won't plan a thing, you know, and uh, we'll just let the Holy Spirit lead. I've been in those services, and the services go off in all directions at once. So anything we say, season it with salt, friends. That's what God expects you to do. But you see, they didn't need methods. They just needed the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was faithful when they were faithful. The Holy Spirit is always faithful, and he called to repentance those who would believe. And when God gave me this commission, it was impressed upon me from the beginning to go make disciples for 23 years. That's all I've ever tried to do, make a disciple. I have never offered them anything else than discipleship to Jesus. That's why I got in trouble in my Baptist pastorates, because I never offered them anything else but the Word of God and discipleship to Jesus. We don't offer you a thing here to get you to come except the Word. All we promise you is a cross. All we can promise you is ridicule and rejection by the religious system of this world. All we can promise you is trial and testing of your faith. And therefore, if you choose to come anyway, it's not because you've come to follow me or anything I've told you. It's because you've heard his voice and you're following him. And all the proof I need that you're not following me. Some people say, well, they're Freemanites. 
All the proof that I need they're not following me is that I know that I never give you anything to follow me for. I'm not even a good pastor, as they measure pastors. Shaking hands at the door, visiting you at least twice a year. I don't give you a thing to follow me for. I don't offer you anything but a crucified life and a walk of total faith, and that is a trial. And so if you come anyway and you receive the word, it's because you're following him and not me. I don't offer you a thing to follow me for. I can have churches all over the place. Somebody said, are you establishing churches here? I said, no, that isn't my calling. Not to build churches, to build up the body of Christ, wherever it is. And so if you come, it's because you've heard his voice. I want you to like me, but I want you to like him first. It's because you've heard his voice, and you're one of his sheep. His sheep, he says, hear his voice, and they follow him. Would you stand with me? Praise him. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed Lord, we know you have a people. We know that we are your people because we have heard the voice of the Son of God. We have believed and received your word. Grant, O Lord, repentance unto life to all those that we come in contact with with this word. You've told us to intercede and to pray and travail for the souls of men. But, O God, help us, help us to be willing before we go to wait and learn what we're to say when we go. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, if you're one of his sheep this morning and have heard his voice, you know that's how you know that he was praying for you that night, dear friends. I didn't say that. He said it. I pray not for the world, but for those thou hast given me. And if you've been moved upon by the word of God this morning, if your heart's been touched and moved to repentance, then just open your heart right now and receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart. As your Lord and Savior, say right now, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. And I receive you now as Lord and Savior into my heart. Into my heart. Some of you need just to do that who are members of churches. You've never made a real commitment just between you and the Lord. You've walked an aisle, you've made a decision, but have you received the sovereign God of heaven as Lord and Savior? Because if you have, you'll be obeying him. And if you don't find it in your heart to be obeying him, it can only mean you're not his sheep. So ask him to come into your heart this morning. That I want to obey. I want to follow you. I'm hearing the shepherd's voice this morning. Hallelujah. If you've heard his voice already, if you have received him, you need the empowering then of the Holy Spirit to walk in the victory that he has provided for you at Calvary. He never sends anything to us, puts anything in his church that we don't need. And he said over and over again to his people, receive the Holy Spirit. Don't try to witness or serve me without the Holy Spirit. So if this is your desire this morning, then receive the Holy Spirit. You come, we will lay hands on your head. You want to come and make a confession of Christ before this body to begin your walk in confession. You do that. The word says, He that believeth in his heart, he believes unto righteousness, and confession is made unto salvation. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you need any other ministry this morning, why, the body will believe with you. We believe here. We have faith. And we believe that God will touch you at the point of your faith. Hallelujah. Here's my cup.
to your seen fit to see us as your people, to call us to life. Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Well, praise God, hallelujah. Jesus is wonderful. Amen. Amen. He's Lord too. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord.